life through him. Amen. Jesus did not go to the cross in order to forgive you. Merely. If God's aim was to forgive you, then you will be a clean, forgiven corpse. God's aim was not ultimately just to forgive you. His aim was for him to be raised so that you and I can participate in his resurrection so that you and I can live a new life. Amen. And that new life is what James is talking about. As a pastor, he's a community who claims resurrection, who claims forgiveness, who claims born again, but they still live old life. You see, that's what bothers James. So what he does is not just being legalistic or pharisaical and say, be better. He says, listen, let's go back to the power of resurrection. Let's go back to the word of God planted in you, the word of God that gave you new birth, the word of God that sets you free, and let's live it. And if you're not, let's say that you're not so that God can help you. Amen. And this week, James is talking about really important topic of your words. How many of you speak? And it's pretty important. Uh, look, look at like you know, telephone bills that you get. And some of you, you speak better with texting than the words. Hold on. He's, that person's right next to you and you're texting each other. And we speak so much, but if you're born again, I think James is saying, if you have true faith, I think James is saying, your words must be transformed. Amen. Your words must be transformed because you are made in God's image. And when God spoke, he created life, order, light, beauty. His words are creative and powerful and we are made in God's image in such a way that our words are also important and heavy and powerful. Amen. If our words in God's, you know, um, if rock goes bad, how bad can it go? Bad rock. <laughs> Very bad, evil rock. <laughs> you know? I mean, rock cannot be all that evil or all that good, in fact. That's the level of the rock. Um, trees can't be all that evil. The evil tree. Uh, all right, dog can be more evil because it's higher up, if you will. Listen, e dog cannot be that evil. It's, it's limited in its capability of being evil or good, actually. We, in the image of God, we can be very beautiful. Our words can be very powerful for good, or we could be very evil. Amen. And our words must be redeemed. That's why James is dealing with here, very important topic, we need to have transformed speech and words. Because we are made in the image of God. And if you say you have true faith, let your words be transformed. Amen. Sounds good? So let's go to James uh, chapter 1, uh, chapter 1, verse chapter 3. <clears throat> Verses 1 to 12. So let's rise for the reading of the word. And um, let's have all the, um, the right side, your right side to me, so your right side, read ver uh, odd verses and the left side read even verses. Let's go. Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. When we put bits into the mouth of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boast. 
consider what a great forest is set on fire by small spark. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring altogether? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Um, I, I think our text flows like this. Our words are very important. It is so, so, so important. It's more important than you think. And therefore, our words uh, are very powerful. Not only they are powerful, they are really dangerous. More than you think. And worst of all, this dangerous word cannot be tamed. The scripture says, no man could tame the tongue. But it must be transformed, you see. Our words must be transformed. So that's how our, our, our text will flow, uh, and our message will flow. Um, God wants our word to be transformed. Amen. Because you're made in God's image, and you are God's people, and we live on God's word. And our words, our words must reflect God. Amen. So God, and James is so much, he wants us to live as real Christians, not just pretending Christians. And real Christians are characterized by not only word of God in us, word of God coming out from us. Amen. Because he's convinced the words are very important. It's not nothing. It's very important. In fact, probably one, what that makes us different from other animals, apart from other things, uh, intelligence and in, uh, our tool making capacity and all that. But more than that, that we are able to speak. But we don't just gibberish about, you know, give me food or give me water. I mean, we're able to speak deep things and communicate to God and praise God at that level. And our words are so important. That's why verses 1 and 2 says, uh, don't presume to be teachers. Don't want to be teachers. I know there are many people who want to be teachers for the, all the wrong reasons. And this is kind of a um, terrible verse for Handong University because there are so many teachers here. And, and there's so many of you, you want to be teachers, and, and, and you have been teacher, teaching Sunday school, or you do Arbeit, or you do, you know, you know, teaching is very dangerous and powerful, and that's what James is saying. Uh, yeah, and you may want to be teacher for the, all the wrong reasons, maybe um, for vanity. You want to show off how smart you are, or um, maybe self-deception. You think you are very smart and wise. And, and you are self-deceived and you perpetuate your self-deception by your profession because now you are a teacher. Or, you know, or maybe you love the status of being a teacher. Well, you know, I teach many kids. You know. I, I don't know. But whatever the reason might be, or some of you want to teach in, in this church, you want to teach in Bible studies, a small group, because you want to be a leader or you want, you know, you, you want to go out and make your mark. You, know, you want to be somebody. However, whatever the case, what James is saying is, be very careful because teachers speak a lot. You teach with your words. And the teaching is a kind of speech where you have a tremendous influence over other people. People actually have to listen to you. For most of your friends, maybe they don't listen to you, but the, you have to, your, teach, no, your students have to listen to you. And, and you represent the teaching authority of God. You represent teaching authority of God. Teaching is not just conveying mere information about this thing. You teaching, you, you must, you, you wind up instilling values. 
you shape that person's identity. And you plant ideas into a person's life, and that could transform that person forever. Teaching is very, very, very influential. Amen. So be very careful, James says. And if you do teach, teach out of fear and trembling. And, with, and go to God and say, God, have my teaching reflect you and not me and my vain glory. My, not my human wisdom, but your wisdom. Oh, God, have mercy on me. So I do not let other people astray with my opinions, but I represent God really well. Amen. You understand, you could teach math or physics or you could teach Spanish, but you don't wind up just teaching Spanish or just teaching math. You do wind up influencing that person in a deeper way. You see that, right? I, I remember when I was a kid, I, I had a Spanish teacher. Her name was uh, Mrs. Jimenez. And, and one day, uh, I, I had a blue shirt on, and she looked at me and says, well, <clears throat> I had a different name back then, so, but I won't share it with you. She, she, she said, mm, Young Ho, you look so handsome in that blue shirt. One comment. And that whole year, I wrote that shirt almost every day. <laughs> and this was junior high, you know, where kids are fashion conscious. But for me, that just, that shaped everything. I'm kidding. I look good in blue. Right? Because Mrs. Him, I mean, just little thing. And, and, and many of you, when I read your testimonies, when I talk to you, many of you say the people that influence you the most are your teachers. Many of you say that. When I was in grade 8, grade 9, grade 10, you know, so-and-so, Mr. So-and-so really shaped my life. Because teaching is that important. It's potential to do that. <clears throat> I, I, I just, uh, I heard this story before. Um, there was a young girl with, she was born with cleft lip. You know what that is? Uh, you, your lip is split so you don't look um, as nice as, as other, other young kids. So she always felt insecure because she, her, her face was, had a cleft lip. And, and she also had a loss of hearing in one ear. So she always felt like people didn't like her. She was always alone. And, 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 sh and she was in this class one day. And she was like maybe second grade or something like that. And, and every year they have a hearing test where teachers would go to their ear and whisper something. And you usually whisper something kind of dumb, like sky is blue or, you know, you know I, I don't know, it's raining outside or something. And they, you know, they're made to repeat them. Did you hear me? So she felt really insecure, so she, you know, and, and she kind of cheated and turned the, her good ear toward the teacher um, so that she didn't want to come out, you know, be noticed by other kids as having a deaf ear. So she turned the wrong ear, and the teacher whispered into her ear, and it was a lady teacher, and she said, I wish you were my little girl. And that just brightened her day and her life. And uh, words are very powerful. Especially as teachers, we are conveying ideology, value. We're not, we're not, we don't just teach one topic. We, we give them who we should be and how we should live. It, it comes out. So teachers, be careful. And don't be too quick to be teachers. Do it under fear and trembling because you know God cares about what you say. Amen? He says God will judge Christians. Uh, God will not judge Christians for our sins to condemn us. I mean, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But there is sort of this judgment of God to evaluate our lives. So if you look at, you know, 1 Corinthians 15, it talks about, you know, what we build with our life will be judged under fire. And what will remain will remain for the Lord. Friends, our words, we build with our words. We bless with our words. We tear down with our words. We will be judged. We will be evaluated. Our beauty of our life or whether we wasted our life, it will all come out. The quality of your life will come out. And much of the quality of your life is revealed by your words. That's what verse 2 says. Let's look at verse 2. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone never had thought in what he says, he's a perfect man. Able to keep his whole body in check. Amen. Why? Because... The words reveal your character. Your words must, it, it must come out in some way. You understand? Your heart will come out. Your character will come out. Your value will come out. Your love will come out 
one way or the other, one time or another, of course we try to package it, we try to do cosmetics with our words, we try to be very, you know, nice, flowery, but somehow, somewhere, it'll all come out and your real self will come out. And if your words, if you don't sin and you don't stumble with your words, it's that you are mature, you're a complete person, you're the person that you are meant to be because you're able to speak from the heart that loves God. And you are able to say no to the heart that does not love God, you see. So it says you're a perfect man if you control your tongue. Jesus says, Matthew 12, from the overflow of your heart, uh, your tongue speaks, your mouth speaks. So whatever in your heart will come out. It reveals your life. Listen, friends, your words are your words. And once it comes out, it's yours that came out. Amen? That's why your words are so important. It has power to redirect. It has power to change. It's power to kill. It's not nothing. They reflect who God is. Now, God's word reflects who he is, his character, his wisdom, his heart. Your word reflects your character, your wisdom, your heart. Amen. Very important. So words are very powerful, you see. Um, let's look at verses 3 to 5. Let's read it together. When we put bits into the mouth of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they're very large and driven by strong wind, they're steered by very small rudder. Wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, a tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boast. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. Amen. Your words are just coming from small vocal cords. Apparently, women have smaller vocal cords than men. Shorter. That's why it's easier for you to speak, actually. Because it takes less energy to um, strain, to, to, to exercise. I, 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 no comment on that. Anyway. Um, but proportion-wise, men are just as foolish as women <laughs> in our words. We say less words, but the more percentage of less things we say are foolish. Um, words are very powerful. Amen. Do you not know that? Right? I mean, whenever someone says things like, the words comes out, let's eat. It moves a big man like me. And it moves me to tears, you know. And it has emotional impact on me, you know, deep emotional impact. You know, let's eat meat. And, and, and that's it. I mean, you know, you know, my moods are transformed, you know. My whole schedule is okay. I cancel everything. Let's go eat meat, you know. And it's just words, but they change things. Especially, you know, um, when the person says, I am buying. That's it. It's very powerful. <laughs> and if you say you are buying, it has impact upon your finances. Okay, it's not just words. It's, you see, words are not just words. It, it moves the universe. It moves the world. It changes things around. And it makes you commit. I am buying. I mean, day that I said, will you marry me? That, and that's what made me what I am today. I mean, just simple phrase. And, and please don't say, guys, don't, don't say, will you marry me? And say, I was just joking. Okay, because you, know, you can't take it back. Will you marry me? Ah, I take it back. I, I changed my mind. <laughs> because words like that, once it's out, you can't gather them back into your word. It's out there, and you have to now, where's Alexis? Oh, he's not here. He ran away. <clears throat> so, oh, no, no, he didn't run away. No, no, Alexis had to go to the army <clears throat> uh, so he could prepare for his bride. Uh, <clears throat> Did I say you can't take words back? Oh, boy. I'm not looking at you this way anymore, Yulia. So, see, Alexis, by the sheer, I'm continuing with this, by sheer force of his words, has tied his entire life to this woman, you know, with, with, with words. And in fact, 
that word, will you marry me, will lead to a deeper word one day, soon this year, when he will confess in front of everybody, but really in front of himself and the woman, in front of God, his word will bind them in a covenant that God will hold them together. And God will hold them responsible for that word. Amen. Words are not nothing. They're very, 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 very important. Amen. Just because some of you, you say so many words that are useless, you think your words are useless. They're not. You, you may say useless words, but even your useless words will make you into a useless person, you see. It doesn't do nothing. It does something. If you speak useless words, you become a useless person. It has that power to make you useless. Yeah? That person's word is empty. Well, you become an empty person. Or some of you say, oh, but I speak, but I, I don't act. Like that fake faith. I speak, but I don't act. Well, that speaking will lead to self-deception. It will deceive you to hell. You know, that's how powerful your words are. Amen. Uh, I remember uh, when I was grade three, um, it was, uh, that was when I was grade two or three, I don't remember. That was when I was just leaving Korea to move to U.S. And I had a teacher in Korea. I, I forgot his name, but I remember his face. And he had a very nice face. And he, he was a bald, older man, <coughs> but very kind. And I remember um, him saying to me over and over, um, and he, he, I think my memory tells me he only said it to me. Um, every time I, I answer a question or something like that, he says to me, young Ho, you are so, so, so smart. I mean, truly. And he said in Korean, no cham. He says cham really long. No cham tok tok hada. No cham. So I remember him saying that even now at my um, Age 20 something, you know? you know? I still remember him saying that. And I bask in that glory. And I come home and, and I tell my mom, Mom, did you hear that? What, uh, I, did I tell you what the teacher said? He said, I am. <coughs> and my mom would say, Of course you are. And in fact, that the, my teacher's words calling me smart, it wasn't that powerful because my mom has been telling me that for years and years and years and years that I, I was so smart. And so, so for me, it was actually, it was, of course, I'm smart. Um, and that's why even now, if, if every one of you calls me stupid, um, it wouldn't really affect me at all <laughs> because you're all wrong. <laughs> and I forgive you for being wrong. I mean, you could be wrong. Because the words of my mother's blessing have so, so fortified my heart that if I'm ever criticized, stuff like that, it, you know, it, it feels bad. But it doesn't really get to my heart and, and, you know, and destroy me because I just feel compassion for the people who criticize me. Because you're wrong because my mother's right. Because my mother has always been right, especially when she blessed me. You know what I mean? So words have that kind of power to impact a person, shape a, a destiny. Um, in fact, Proverbs uh, uh, eighteen twenty one says, words have um, power of life and death. And those who love it will eat its fruit. Amen. Um, therefore, the words are so dangerous. Especially if your word, the powerful image of God, the word, if it's under the control of sin, death, selfishness, vain glory, sinful ambition, Jealousy, hatred, discord. If your words are under control of pride and fear, it could devastate a person, a culture, a community, nation, history. Yes? You see how dangerous words are too? I mean, same words. What if my mother didn't say, you are so, so, so smart. What if my mother says, what? Your teacher's out of his mind. You're so stupid. Remember, young old, you're so st- What if she said that? You know how that would change my world? I wouldn't want to go to school. I would want to go play soccer or something. Because I'm so stupid, you see. And I will repeat what she says. And my repetition of what she says will redirect my heart all the more. Right? I am dumb. I'm stupid. Because my mother said so. Because what? And so on and so forth. 
It'll devastate my, my life. Hmm? Or words like, I hate you. Shut up. You're no good. You're lazy. You're stupid. You'll never make it. What's wrong with you? You're too young. You're too old. You're too fat. You're too fat. But I'm beautiful, no matter what people say. See, that's what people are saying. You're not beautiful. Get away from me. Why can't you be more like your sister? Your sister is more beautiful than you. Why can't you be like Daniel? He's got it all together. Hmm? So when so his father plays with his children, how about you? You're a bad husband. I am sorry that you were ever born. In fact, um, I have a friend whose mother told her that. And it burned in her mind and heart for a long time. And that explains a lot of what she does and why she does what she does. You're crazy. What kind of Christian are you? Give up. God doesn't answer prayer. Stop being idealistic. Just don't stop praying. Praying doesn't do anything. You're hypocrites. Why don't you just go die? Have you heard those words in you from other people, from yourself? We say things like sticks and stones will break my bones, but your words will never hurt me. That's a lie. Sticks and stones will break your bone, but words will set your life on fire. And you're going to burn, you know, you, when your mother says you're stupid, that's going to tr- spread the fire, and I'm also ugly, I'm also unlovable, unlovely. I can't do anything. I hate life. I hate people. I hate everyone. I'm just going to, you know, and it spreads, and the poison that's in you, you're going to spread to other people. And that person gets all fired and burned. (laughs) And pretty soon the whole community is gossiping, hating, backbiting, complaining. But you see, we do this in such a nice way. You know, Satan, with just few words, destroyed the whole history of the world. Satan did not destroy the world by uh, throwing the woman by evil power. He didn't do that. He comes very attractively. He just speaks few words, and that did it. You know, many of you, your powerful evil words, they don't look evil nor powerful. You boast a little bit. You hide a little bit. You lie a little bit. You slant the truth a little bit. You kind of gossip a little bit, but in a way that doesn't make you look too bad. All that leads up to fire of hell, restless evil full of poison. Amen. You understand? This restless evil, fire, dangerous stuff that that James is talking about, it's not obvious. But it's there killing you and me. Lies. Hmm? Words have changed history. Where did Hitler come from? Where did Stalin come from? Where did all this fight and war come from? I tell you, so much of it Come from words spoken into their lives, a word spoken by them. It's words. Um, I don't know. Do you get the sense that James is saying your words are very important, your words are very powerful? And James has taken the direction of his text to really dark place. It's powerful in a very bad sense. It's your words are killing me. Your words are reflecting the fire from hell. It's terrible. That's what James is saying. Um, You know, I just read an article, um, a a study. I heard about this study regarding um, good marriage and bad marriage. And and this study says, you know, what makes the difference between uh, marriage that lasts and marriage that ends in the middle? Um, They studied whether... Their level of affection was made any factor and, and when, the, when they got married. And, and the answer is no. It makes no difference um, 
they all love each other. Um, uh, what about their personality? What about other things? And they really made very little factors, actually. And, and, and they begin to do longitudinal study, and they realize at some point, they, they begin to see one factor that, be, that begins to be indicator of it's going to split or it's going to go on. And indicator is at some point, the couples that st- stay on and couples that break, they begin to diverge on this issue. The couples that stay on, five out of 100 words, five out of 100 words were negative words that cut down each other. Couples that split, it begins with 10 out of 100 words were negative toward each other. And you cut down and you say negative things to one another. And then it, it goes like this. And the couples that end up divorcing, more percentage of the conversation is they're gossiping about each other, they're saying bad things about each other, they're bad things to one another. And words are that powerful, it, it, it melts your heart. And it, it, makes, it makes your heart cold. And it hardens your heart. And, and it's words that will do it. And the good couples, actually, they have lots of affectionate words. And they have lots of blessing words to one another. And that, that's how powerful words are. And it's words that will, that will drive your marriage and drive your life into one direction. Listen, James here ends with very kind of negative sort of direction. Words are powerful, but under the control of your sinful heart, pride, vainglory, ambition, deceit, your words are like Satan's words, demonic. You deceive, you attack, you show off, and it echoes fire from hell. That's what James says. And you know what's really bad? Let's look at verse 7 and 8. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, creatures of the sea are being tamed. And we've been tamed and have been tamed by man. But let's read verse 8. Let's read it together. But no man can tame the tongue. It is restless evil, full of deadly poison. Amen. That's how James ends verse 8. No man could tame the tongue. It's so powerful. Yeah, but it's powerful under heart that is sinful. And heart that's not controlled by God. And it's deadly. And you cannot tame it. Isn't that bad? That's so sad. You know, um, in the beginning it says, if, if, you, if you don't sin with your tongue, you're a perfect man. But what if you're mute? Then, then is that perfect man? But it will come out. Uh, I don't know what I said to you just now with my hands. If not your hands, it will come out your facial expression. Communication will come out meaningfully. And you cannot tame the tongue. What's inside will come out. That's what Ma- uh, Matthew says in 12. Jesus says that. You know, I heard about this story about a frog. Where a um, frog wanted to go from here, uh, go across the lake or something like that, across the fields. And so he told the stork, you know, stork, uh, can you fly me across? And the stork says, I can't carry you. You're too slimy, you're too big, whatever. And, and so the frog had an idea. He says, why don't I take a straw and put it in my mouth, and you take the other end of the straw, and you, when you fly, then we can fly together. And the stork said, that's a pretty good idea. And so they actually try this, and they're flying, and, and they're flying. The frog is flying. It's wonderful. So he's uh, going across the field really high, and he's like, oh, I believe I could fly. I believe I could touch the sky, you know, that sort of thing. But he's humming it because, he, you know, he can't let go of his you know, straw. Mm-hmm. And, and it, all these other frogs down there, they're amazed. They said, that is unbelievable. <laughs> that is total genius. I, I wonder who ever thought of that idea. And frog couldn't resist. It was me. It was my idea. And he fell to his death. We can't control our tongue. You could try to manage it. You know, certain, like, what if you have a rattlesnake in your house? 
you think you tamed it, next day it will bite you to death. We think we tamed our tongue. And we think we're, we're pretty cool and chic and all that. And it will come out. So my question, friend, is there hope in this text? Words are powerful, but words are dangerous and it's deadly. And your words are evil. Right? That's what James says. Is there hope for us? I think there's a hope. Let's go to 9 to 12. In fact, there's real more hope in 13 to 18. And, and someone really um, urged me to preach 13 to 18. But um, I couldn't. That would be too long of a message. So, uh, But let's look forward to 13 to 18. But let's look 9 to 12. Let's read it together. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father. And with it, we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or grapevine bear, uh, bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. I think there's hope in this. Listen. The reasonable contrast in verse 9, although because we, heard, we read this before, we said, oh yeah, okay. But really, um, if we didn't read it before, it will seem a little bit odd. Because the, the normal contrast should be, with tongue we curse men, and with tongue we bless men. That's what it should be. And we, uh, yeah, it should not be like that. Right? The normal contrast is, with one lips, you, you say Daniel is such a wonderful person. You turn around, you say Daniel is a terrible person, and it should not be. Okay, That's what the normal contrast should be. But that's not how James contrasts it. What James contrasts is, with tongue you praise the Lord Jesus and the Father, and then with the same tongue you curse men, and this should not be. What's the difference? If you bless men and curse men, that's really coming from the same stream. Non-Christian could come and, and speak good of someone and turn around and speak bad of the someone. Me, before knowing Christ, I could easily bless someone and curse someone with the same tongue. At the same time, even. I could even do that. But friends, you cannot praise God without grace of God. Amen. You understand? You cannot really praise God, honor God, bless God without God's grace. It takes a miracle me and you to praise God. No, I mean, you could sing, you could mouth the word, but you could never praise God without God's supernatural changing of heart, planting of his word, being born again of his word, and God plants the word in your heart, and the word of God frees you to praise God. Amen. You understand? Before I became a Christian, I did go to church and I did sing songs, but I wasn't praising. But at some point, I praised God. And it was amazing. And I really love God. And I really praise God. But I knew this is not possible without God's grace. Yes? That's why Paul, uh, James says it really is two different things. There are two different streams. Praising God is different. Root, source altogether than blessing or cursing men. Amen. Yes? This is what James is saying. And I know that may, there are many of us here today that you actually do have two sources in your life. That many of you, you are capable of praying to God, praising God, loving God with your word, and, and it comes from the Holy Spirit. God has planted his word in your heart. You've been born again. God's word is living in you. And by that word, you say, I love you, Jesus. And you mean it because it's giving you new birth. There's a new affection. And the word of God planted in you, frees you, it mirrors you, and you love God and you praise God. At the same time, you could turn around and Monday morning, you could complain or you could criticize others, not from the word of God planted in you, but from the wisdom of the world that's planted in you as well. You see? Amen. And that's what James is saying. For those of you, you are Christians, you have been born again of the word, this should not be. May you live from faith, 
may you live from the word that's been planted in you. Amen. That's what James is saying. But let me say this. There's hope. At least there is another entire new life planted in you. Amen. At least it could be a transformation. At least now there is two sources and from which you are encouraged and empowered to live from one source. Namely, the life that God has planted in your heart. Amen. But if there's no life planted in you, if you've not been born again of his word, then you cannot humbly accept the word planted in you. But you can now, you see. So friends, Jesus was raised so you and I could live a new life. Yes? Friends, Jesus resurrected and he's given us the Holy Spirit and new birth so that our words must be transformed. And how is it transformed? He's slow to speak. He's quick to hear. What do you hear? You ask for the wisdom of God. And verses 13 to 18 talks about the wisdom that comes from above. That is life-changing. That's life-giving. That's gentle and beautiful and peacemaking. Amen. And you humbly receive day after day the word of God that's planted in you. And let that word of God become freedom to you because it becomes yours. So that whatever comes out from your word, let it come out out of the heart that's been grabbing you, giving you life and healing you because you've been free and you've been judged by the word that set you free. Amen. Let that word planted in you be your word. Let the word of God be your word. Let the heart of God be your heart. Let the values of God be your value. Let the beauties and joys of God be beauties and joy of your own heart. So that your life and your word will be blessing, life-giving, light-giving, truth-telling, compassionate, humble, praising God with these lips. That's possible. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. You and I are not just animals. You and I are in the image, in the order of God. Where our l- mouth was built to kiss God's my mouth. So the man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And it comes into me so that what comes out from me, Lord God, may be life-giving, life-transforming. Your friendships will change. Your family life will change. Your Dreams will change. Your studies will change. Your relationships will change because you will echo with your own mouth the voice of Jesus. It becomes your voice. Your destiny will change as you change, as you are changed by God's word planted in you. So confess this day, Lord, I've been sinful with my words. You've given me power called word, and I've been wasting it. It's been stupid, foolish, light, dumb. My words were empty. No, my words were arrogant. My words were harmful. My words were critical. My words were jealous and envious. My words been cutting down other people. My words have repeated lies after lie. And Lord, I confess today, woe is me. I am a sinful man. Among sinful people, I am undone. So allow the word of God to come to you and touch your lips. The hot coal of God's word cleanse your lips so that your words could now bring life, joy, goodness, reflect Christ. Amen. Because with your lips, you can praise God. And you don't have to praise men. Wish you might be. Let's pray.